of Psalms tonight. The book of Psalms. I am excited uh, for our mission trip that we are um, going to be going on here this, uh, this coming week. We leave Sunday afternoon and head over to the Delphs, and Pastor reiterated some of that, so I won't go into great detail. On Wednesday, our plan is to give everyone, uh, our church members, an itinerary so that you could pray. I'm thankful for those who have reached out and said, hey, what can we do? How can we help? And uh, what, how can we send you off? I know Charmay sent us a, a nice text and a note asking, what, can, what more can we do? And I, I really appreciate that heart of just asking, hey, this is an important thing that the youth and sponsors are doing, and what can we do to support? And I really appreciate all those uh, notes, texts, and, and, and questions about what, what, what is a, a way that we can be a blessing. And so I would say at the very top of that list is just pray. Pray that the Lord would really work on the hearts of not only the people we're ministering to there in Belize, but on our young people's heart, on our hearts as sponsors, and, uh, and that we'd be a blessing to the missionaries. We get to catch a burden for what the Lord is doing uh, across the world, and, and particularly in the country of Belize. And so and that's, that's really at the top of the list. So we'll provide an itinerary. You can follow along uh, at home as we're away and, and pray for every single day what we'll be doing that particular day. That would be a, a great help. As I thought about traveling, going different places, and thought about preaching here tonight, we were going to go to Acts 16, and there's a lot there, and we're going to look at that. I'm excited. First convert of Europe and how the gospel is going to spread. I think almost everybody has been touched by that, probably that first convert, Lydia, getting saved there in Acts 16, with the exception of maybe a few of us uh, that maybe um, uh, were saved through some different influences. But Europe has touched many uh, that have been influenced by Christianity, and so we're going to look at that. But tonight, I want to just take a little break, and uh, really, as we plan on going on this mission trip to Belize, just direct our attention to some thoughts here uh, in the book of Psalms that uh, has been on my heart, and trust that it'll be a blessing to you, and maybe even a way that you could pray for us as we go uh, this coming week. This psalm that we're looking at is called the Traveler's Psalm. The Traveler's Psalm. Uh, it, was, uh, it, it was written about by a commentator named Haddon Robinson, who wrote a lot, a lot about preaching, actually, and he talked about this psalm being the, a psalm a favorite of his own dad. His dad was Scottish, and it may have been they who penned the idea of this being the Traveler's Psalm. Uh, whenever a uh, family member, a guest, or a friend was leaving on a journey, this psalm uh, was read, and actually oftentimes it was sung, um, and it was sung, and it was prayed as well. Uh, Had Robinson in his, in his note said, when my father left the old country as a teenager, he came to the United States, he was bidden farewell with this psalm. Over the years, my father enjoyed many hearty days and endured others that were dark and grim. He carried this psalm's words with him into battle during World War I and then out of it as he lay in the hospital for almost a year recovering from shrapnel wounds. In verse number one, the psalmist looked beyond the hills to the God who made those hills. My father lived in the toughest section of New York City. Although he seldom saw hills, he held to the assurance that the God of the hills was the God of the dangerous streets as well. And so this psalm comforts us when there's danger, it also comforts us when we're about to go on a journey. And so with that in mind, would you look at Psalm 121? I want to direct your uh, eyes to the heading of this psalm. The Bible says, Psalm 121, a song of degrees. This is the second song of degrees. Uh, psalm 120 is the first song of degrees. We've mentioned uh, this title before various times, but just to refresh your memories, what is the song of degrees or a, a song of ascents? They're a collection of 15 songs that were probably compiled um, all in, in one setting, probably in a song book or a hymn book. And uh, the Israelites, the ancient Israelites, would sing the song of ascents or song of degrees. Uh, much of the background has been lost in history as to when or why these were sung. But there are some good, educated guesses, I guess you could say, and really three categories of explanation of when these songs of ascents or songs of degrees were used. And really they fit into these categories. Either they were speaking of a spiritual ascent, a musical ascent, or a physical ascent. There were some commentators or uh, theologians in the early centuries of Christianity that said these songs were really detailing spiritual ascent. In other words, it really... Uh, mapped out the journey of the spiritual life, going from being lost to being saved to being sanctified to being glorified. Um, although later on, more, as more commentators study these 15 psalms, they said that it doesn't quite fit 
the trajectory of these 15 psalms, so they've kind of ruled that one out. Some say it's a, a musical ascent. A lot of the reformers, they have that kind of idea that these were a, a musical. They were raised. How many of you know what a key change is in music? Have you know what a key change is? And so when uh, Megan is playing the piano in a verse and it, it kind of just jumps up a step, it kind of gives the, the song a little bit more lift, a little more oomph. And that's kind of the idea. There will be 15 key changes, as it were, in, in Hebrew. And that's maybe what it was. But if you know, if you sang one or two key changes, you would think 15 would be really tough to sing. And so usually that's ruled out as not probably not a possibility. But the third one is probably where most commentators land. It's probably the most probable uh, way this, these psalms were used. And it speaks of a physical ascent. Now, when we talk about a physical ascent, there's probably some more explanations as to what kind of physical ascent are we talking about. Three main um, ideas have been proposed. The first one is that these songs were written at the close of the Babylonian captivity in 539 B.C. And as the Israelites were coming back to Israel or to Judah, and as they were going back home, they would sing these songs on their physical ascent back home. But most... Commentators don't think that's probably the reason, although some hold to that being the, the, the reason. The Talmud, the, the Jewish collection of writings, preferred that these 15 songs were sung as you went up literally to the temple. There were 15 steps leading up to the temple, and as you went on the first step, you would sing Psalm 120. When you got to the second step, you would sing Psalm 121, and so on and so forth until you got to the temple ready to worship God and would culminate in that final song of ascent or song of degrees. But... The most popular and most widely accepted view is not any of those two of those physical ascents, but this third view. And it's this. It's my view as well, that these songs were sung by pilgrims. They were sung by people on a journey to Jerusalem to observe and worship God in the three annual feasts that God commanded the Israelites to come back to Jerusalem and all together worship God. And so that's the most persuasive view in my opinion, that these songs, these 15 songs, were a collection of hymns that were sung every year by pilgrims going to Jerusalem, ready to worship God at Passover and the successive feasts. And so with that background in mind, think about this. As a pilgrim is traveling to Jerusalem, he would be singing these songs. And we're going to focus our attention on the second psalm of degree Psalm 121. Notice the text. Would you follow along as I read out loud? I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. There's a geographical feature that jumps out at to, you, to you in verse number one. The idea is, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. Hills. This word hills is used throughout the New Testament, or excuse me, the Old Testament, and it describes not just little bunny hills, as we would say it, but it describes big, huge mountains as well. And so the idea of hills in your mind is not necessarily the idea that, that, that's conveyed in the word hills today. It's the idea of mountains in this text. The idea of large hills, of, of, of hills that really look menacing, of hills that look troubling, hills that would cause fear. And these hills, as these pilgrims would journey to Jerusalem, would surround the city of Jerusalem. It was a city that was situated on big hills, big, really, mountains. And the journey to Jerusalem in the Bible is always uh, described as going up to Jerusalem. Even if you were going from the north to the south, it was still described as going up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem sat at a high point in the nation of Israel. So no matter whether you were north, east, south, or west, you were always going up to Jerusalem. You were always climbing hills. It reminded me of the story that Pastor told about riding bikes up the hill. Were you there, Mrs. Brown, when he was telling that, 
kind of embarrassing story. Okay, and you just let it happen. You just let it go. Okay, you forgave him. Love covers a multitude of sins, as what I've heard. Okay, well, that's what this is reminding me of. It reminded me of going up steep, difficult hills to Jerusalem. The journey to Jerusalem would have been very difficult. It would have been filled with climbing hills. And so this psalmist is really, I want you to get this picture in mind because it will set a great backdrop to the truth of this psalm. This psalmist begins in the first person. He says, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills. And when he is talking about those hills, he is talking about those foreboding hills surrounding the city of Jerusalem. And he says, I will lift up mine eyes unto these hills. And then he asks a question. It may not look like a question to you, but the word whence is used about 17, 18 times in the Old Testament, almost exclusively denoting an interrogative, a rhetorical or an indirect and sometimes a direct question. And so really the psalmist is saying, is saying as he's walking up to Jerusalem, he's going on this treacherous journey. He has maybe a, a, some kind of backpack. He has provision for himself on the journey. He's got maybe a staff. Maybe he's got some kind of weapon of some sorts. And he's traveling up these hills and he is singing. He is singing this song of ascent as he is ascending or, or going up to Jerusalem. And he sings these words, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. And then he asks this question. From whence cometh my help? And immediately the story that comes to my mind, that floods to my mind, is the story that Jesus told of the Good Samaritan. Do you remember that story? And that situation is not an isolated event. That was the, the basic scenario of anybody traveling through to or back from Jerusalem, whether they were going from Jerusalem to Jericho or Jericho to Jerusalem. That was the predicament. Robbers and thieves and, and, and people that wanted to steal and loot and pillage would hide in the hills. You never know when you crested a hill who was waiting for you there. It was a very, very, not, it was not wise to travel by yourself. And so these pilgrims would often travel with a company, would travel with their families. Remember Jesus as he went with his entire family to, to worship the Lord in, there in Jerusalem. What The entire band was with him, the entire family. For everyone from Nazareth was with him. And, and Jesus' parents assumed that Jesus was with the family because it was a large uh, envoy company that was going up. And that was the normal way to travel. But sometimes, maybe dad had to work overtime and he had to stay back. There would be these lone travelers that would go up to Jerusalem. And I can just imagine the setting of this hymn is one guy. His family's already gone to Jerusalem, and he's just staggering behind. He says, I got to make it there, but I had to do some things back at home, and I'm going by myself. And he's traveling, and he's looking at these hills where danger could be behind any corner, any crevice, any crest. And he looks there at those hills, those mountains with fear. And he says, I'm lifting mine eyes to these hills. And he is almost shaking, I can imagine, staggering and say, asking the question, where Will my help come from? From whence comes my help? And so the hills, there are other times in the text when, they're off, when the word hills or mountains is accompanied with Zion, it refers to a place of God's habitation. It refers to the very city of Jerusalem. I don't think that's what the author had in mind here. I think these hills are not a place of refuge, but they're a flat, in fact a, 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 an object of nuisance. These hills are not his hope. They are his hindrance. These hills don't provide for him tranquility. No, but rather these hills are the cause of, of trepidation and fear. You can understand how this might be as he's traveling up to Jerusalem. And he's going up and he sees these hills. Where will my help come from? And so as he lifts his eyes to the hills, they're not a source of his help. They're a source of his fear. And he has to ask, what's the source of my help? The Bible uses the word help here. It's related to the idea of wall building, raising support columns. It even speaks of a secure footing. And so the idea that the psalmist is asking is, hey, as I'm going up these, these mountains, these hills, what will be the source of giving me support, security, a sure journey, a sure footing as I get to the place of Jerusalem where I can worship God? And the psalmist answers his own question. He answers the question because he knows the answer already. You know, so oftentimes I, I think of it this way as well. We often know the answer to the question, where am I going to get help? 
And it would do us well to verbalize where our help is from. The answer is already known by this pilgrim traveler. And he asserts it in verse number two. So the question that really is on the tip of our tongue oftentimes as we go through life is this. From where will we get help? Where will we get help? Pastor, have you asked that question? Where can I get help? Hey, have you ever asked that question? Where can I get help? As you go through life and, and through different obstacles and, and circumstances in life, where can I get help? Well, as that question sits at the tip of our tongue constantly for the believer, the answer we already know, just as it was known by this pilgrim. Notice the answer that he reiterates to himself in verse 2. My help cometh from the Lord. He doesn't use a descriptive name of God. He uses God's personal name. He is identifying the very God that will be his source of help as he's traveling to Jerusalem with these mountains on every side of him. He says, my help cometh from the Lord. It's not wrong to ask the question as we journey through life, where will I get help? But be assured the answer is always there. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth proper perspective when walking between mountains. That though there are hills and though there are mountains, there is a God that is bigger than those mountains. There is a God that is bigger than those hills. When you're going through life, as we read in this psalm, and you, there's a sun and a moon that may cause uh, some kind of adverse effects upon you. There is a God that is bigger than the, the heat of the sun. There is a God that is bigger than the dangers of the night. As you walk through a valley where there could be potential, metaphorically, robbers and looters and pillagers, notice there is a God that is bigger than all of that. And he has to be our source of security as Christians. And here's the, the main point tonight. God wants you to look beyond the hills. He doesn't want you to ignore the hills because the hills exist. You've got to travel through the hills to get to Jerusalem. You've got to travel through the hills to get to the destination that God has for you. Don't ignore the hills. Don't act like the hills are not there. But look beyond the hills to the God who made those very hills. To the God who who is your help. And so for a few moments, notice the text or notice the title, Help Beyond the Hills. And we know that is God. Something very interesting in this text that not a lot of people have an answer to. And I've thought about it throughout this past week. And I'm going to present to you what I think is the best answer for this. Something unique happens in verse number three. The psalmist, this pilgrim as he's journeying, he asks the question, he sees the fear, he asks the question, he has the answer. And then in verse number three, he switches from first person and he goes to second person. Did you notice that? He goes from I, me, my to he will not suffer thy. And immediately the, the, the question that jumps out to me as I read this psalm, because for the remainder of the psalm, he is talking to somebody. But the scenario that I have contrived in my mind, and maybe it's not accurate, but I imagine this guy is traveling by himself. He's fearful, and he's looking at these hills, and he's worried, where's my help come from? And he reassures himself, my help comes from the Lord. And then he begins really preaching. He begins this, this, this discourse of reminding himself why God is his help. Who is he talking to? Now, there is a chance that maybe he is just talking to fellow travelers, and maybe they're along with him on this journey. But I want to propose to you that perhaps, perhaps he is talking to himself. He's talking to himself. I remember when I was growing up in Chicago, um, my childhood was filled with traumatic events. Um, and they often came at the hands of my youth pastor. I'm, I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek. He, it was, he would, uh, he liked to scare us. He liked to put us on edge. I remember one time we played hide-and-go-seek in the church. And uh, it was a late night. I think it was, it was like one of those all-nighter things that Zach has been constantly asking me to do, to do again. And we're going to do one soon, all right, Zach? Um, but it was one of those things where we played hide-and-go-seek in the church. And our church had this huge organ. It was, it was much larger than this. And all the lights were out and all the kids. We had about 20 of us, and we were all spread out. And, uh, and we couldn't find our youth pastor. And he was like the last one to, to be found. And all of a sudden, and our auditorium was really, really scary. I mean, I guess every kid maybe thinks a dark auditorium is scary. I don't know. But our auditorium was scary. It had these huge, uh, huge pinnacle ceiling. It was shaped kind of like ours, but it was way higher than ours. Uh, I remember one time <laughs> uh, there was a funeral going on on, uh, on Thursday, 
and uh, I was at church on a Wednesday night, and they had to bring the body for some reason on a, on a, on a Wednesday night after the service and leave it at the front of the auditorium. And, um, and I'll never forget this story. Um, I was, my parents always made us sit in the very first couple rows at church, and so I was prone to leave things at church, and I had left my Bible on, the, on like the first pew on that Wednesday night. And uh, for some reason, I don't know why they did this, but they left like the casket open which I don't think was, maybe someone forgot, I don't know. It was late in the evening, and I remember I had to get my Bible. And so the auditorium is dark, and our auditorium had not like a simple flip light. It had this big metal box inside the sound room, and you had to turn things to get all the lights on, and it was very complicated. So what you did, we didn't have cell phone flashlights or anything like that, so you just had to like, you know, you had to go for it. And there was hard pews, and you could hit in the leg. But So I'm, I'm going, and uh, pastor's in the back. He's like, just go get it. He didn't tell me there's a body in the front of the church. And uh, I'm going, and I'm just telling you, I'm this, like, little kid. And I go to my game, I'm out, and there it was. And uh, there's people laughing in the back of the auditorium because I didn't know that it was there that, that evening. Anyway, so traumatic events. But this, this time we were playing hide-and-go-seek, my youth pastor, uh, we were trying to find him. I was, uh, for some reason, I thought I saw him at the front of the auditorium. Again, one of those situations where you can turn on the lights. And there he was playing the organ in a very uh, scary way. And then he looked up, and he had a clown mask on. Uh, to scare us. One time I was in junior church, and the same youth pastor, I wasn't quite a teen yet, he brought a real-life snake in, and he uh, blindfolded us, and he wanted to play like, hey, you know, you put your hand in the box, and you like kind of feel what it was. Did that with a live, can you imagine? We don't do any of that stuff at Kendall Park, and you are very thankful uh, for that. I love him to this day, by the way. He was a great spiritual influence. He just liked to be on the edge, all right? He liked to be on the edge. My house was situated a block from the church, and uh, one of the things that we did, we liked to play after church uh, in, the, in the church uh, a parking lot, and it was a great time. I remember great memories from those, uh, from those years, just like the teens do today, all right? And, uh, but my parents would go home, and they said, you just need to come home by yourself because you could just run across this big field. It had no lights. It was very dark. And I remember late at night after church that and it was very, when I was very young that I was made to run across this field in the dark, and I remember I had memorized the verse, what time I am afraid I will trust in thee. And I would remember, as I was running through that field trying to get home, I would just quote that verse over and over and over and over again because I knew that my source of security was in the Lord because I was scared out of my mind. I knew I couldn't make it on my own, at least I thought. And so I had to quote that verse over and over again. You know what I was doing? I was preaching to myself. And in the same way, in the same way, I think that's what's happening in Psalm 121. I can't prove it for you. You don't have to necessarily take that to the bank, but I think that's the idea of Psalm 121. He's saying, hey, I'm looking at these hills. I'm scared to death. Where in the world am I going to get help? Oh, I remember my help comes from the Lord. And he says, he will not suffer thy foot to be moved. I don't think he's preaching to anybody but himself. He preaches in these verses, verses 3 through 8, eight sermons. Eight sermons. And I want to encourage you, church, when you are looking at daunting hills and you ask the question, where can I get help? And you remind yourself, my help comes from the Lord. The way that you look beyond the hills to the source of your help is by preaching to yourself. Is by reminding yourself who the Lord is. And if you preach to yourself, as I believe the pilgrim is doing, perhaps, these eight sermons, I think they'll be a credible source of comfort to remind you that your help comes from the Lord. Say eight sermons. I can't hardly sit through one sermon of yours, Pastor Josh. How are we going to get through eight? They're going to be really quick. They're mini sermons, okay? Here's sermon number one, that you must preach to yourself to look beyond the hills for your help. Here's sermon number one. It's found in the first part of verse three. He will guide my steps. He will guide my steps. Notice the phrase. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He will not let your foot to be, he will not allow your foot to be moved. In other words, he won't let you fall. The psalmist is preaching to himself this truth. I am going up these mountains. I'm going up this, uh, this arduous journey, and there are rocks, and, the, and the, the pathway may be very narrow. It'll be hard to get to Jerusalem, but here's the message I'm going to preach to myself. The Lord will not allow me to stumble as I go to Jerusalem. I'm reminded of Psalm 1836. The Bible says, thou hast enlarged my steps. It doesn't mean that he's made your feet grow a couple sizes bigger. The idea of enlarged is he's made a wide place for you to step in. The Lord has enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip. 
Here's Psalm 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. When you think of the word ordered, you might have the idea of someone ordering somebody to do something. The Lord orders your steps. That's not the idea of this word ordered. When you go into a messy closet and you order it, the idea is arranging neatly, arranging well to arrange properly. And that's the idea of this word ordered. The steps of a good man, and that word good really has the idea of one that is good by God's standard, one that knows him and is walking with him, has a relationship with him. That good man, his steps will be arranged properly by the Lord. Same idea of Psalm 121, that when you're on the path that God wants you to be, he will not suffer. He will not allow your feet to be tripped up. He will not allow your feet to be moved. And by the way, there's an application here for all of us that I think is important to point out. Where is this pilgrim going? He's going to Jerusalem. Why is he going to Jerusalem? To worship the Lord. When is he going? On, on a feast day. But why is he going to worship the Lord in Jerusalem? Here it is. Because God had commanded a Jewish man to go on that journey. He was being obedient to God. Can I say it this way? He was in the will of God. He was going where God wanted him to go. By the way, you can't preach this message to yourself if you're not on the path that God wants you to be on. If you're not in the center of God's will, headed to the destination God wants you to go, how can you preach to yourself, the Lord will not cause me to stumble? In fact, the Lord may cause you to stumble when you're not going in his will. He might try to get you back on, he might do whatever he can to get you back on the right track. But those that know, hey, I'm where God wants me to go. I am, I'm pursuing a journey that God wants me to go on. You can take it to the bank. God will not allow you to be tripped up. God will establish your feet. God will lay out every step for you. What an incredible message that we can preach to ourselves when we're on a difficult journey in life, when we're headed to the destination that God wants us to be on. I think of uh, my little baby Haddon. And he's just getting to the point where his legs are getting a little bit of strength. He cannot walk. He cannot stand. But if dad's holding his arms, he can stand. The idea of move, the word moved here is the idea of staggering, tottering, shaking, and swaying. That's exactly how a toddler walks, right? It's built into the name, toddling, okay, toddler. And what a toddler needs is help. He needs a father's hands or a mother's hands and arms to guide him, to lift him up. And here's the application. God is a father that, that really stabilizes the tottering and swaying feet of his children by his almighty, powerful hand. God will not suffer your foot to be moved, church. Here's how Spurgeon wrote it in his Treasury of David. Disasters and reverses may lay him low. He may, like Job, be stripped of everything, like Joseph, be put in prison, like Jonah, be cast into the deep. He shall not be utterly cast down, though. He will be brought on his knees, but not on his face. Or if laid, or if laid prone for a moment, he shall be up again ere long. No saint will fall finally or fatally. Sorrow may bring us to the earth, and death may bring us to the grave, but lower we cannot sink. And out of the lowest of all, death. We shall rise to the highest of all heaven's eternity. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. And what an incredible sermon we can preach to ourselves that he will guide our steps. Here's sermon number two. He's never asleep. He's always alert. He's never asleep. He's always alert. Notice the second part of verse three. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor nor sleep. I'm reminded of Isaiah, or excuse me, Psalm 46, verse 1, which says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present, the idea of present, he's always active, a very present help in trouble. Do you remember the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel? Do you remember that story? And one of the ways that Elijah points out the, the, lud the lunacy of these Israelites following false, the false god of Baal is he uses sarcasm. And he uses sarcasm in a very particular way. He illustrates how different Yahweh, the Lord God of heaven, is by their false gods by using the sarcastic tone. Maybe your God is sleeping. Maybe your God is taking a nap. Maybe your God is, is not quite awake. And what a contrast to the God who never sleeps, the true God of heaven who never takes a break. He's always awake. He's always alert. He's always guiding our steps. He's always watching. He's never sleeping. 
The story is told of a man in World War II who was on an American ship that was shot and was sinking. And he dove off the deck and he hung on to something in the water for a while, but he was picked up by a German freighter. He and a couple of other men that were rescued were thrown into the, in the belly of the ship as prisoners to be taken to Germany. And this man wrote in his biography, quote, I began to commune with the Lord there in the belly of the ship. At first I couldn't sleep. The stress was great and the fear was greater. Then I remembered the words of Psalm 21, 121. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He that keepeth thee will not slumber nor sleep. So I said, Lord, there isn't use, any use of both of us staying awake. As long as you're going to keep watch, I'll thank you for some sleep tonight. And he went to bed that evening. He's never asleep. He's always alert. And man, what a message you can preach to yourself when you're looking for help. And you remind yourself the Lord is our help. Preach to yourself these sermons to solidify that truth. To get help beyond the hills. The Lord is never asleep. The Lord will guide my steps. Here's the third sermon you have to preach to yourself. The Lord will be our defender. The Lord will be our defender. And what you'll see throughout this psalm is the language of protection, the language of providence, the, the language uh, uh, of keeping. Notice verse 3. He will not suffer thy foot, uh, thy foot to be moved. He that, here's the word, keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The idea of keeping is the idea of being a guardian, of being a bodyguard, of being a gatekeeper, of being a defender. And here's what the psalmist is saying. He's saying, God is my defense. He is my guardian. He is the one who is my guard. He is the gatekeeper. I want you to notice two applications here. Not only does he say in verse number three, he will keep thee, or he's speaking maybe of himself, me, but he says in verse number four, he will keep who? Israel. Did you notice the contrast? There is a personal application and a corporate application. Here's what I mean. Hey, God promises to be a defender, a guardian, a keeper of his children. He promises to be a keeper of the Christian, but also there's a corporate application. He promises to protect his people, plural. And yes, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's always been Israel. But we have the privilege as believers to be grafted into some of those privileges. As the church, as the body of Christ, we are promised that we will, we will be protected to the end. We'll be kept as a body, as a corporate whole. But individually, we're kept individually as well. What a great God that not only can he protect you individually, he can protect our church. He can protect your family, Dad. He can protect our, uh, uh, our church and, and, and the greater Christian community all over the world, those Christians that are suffering persecution. Just as he protects us here, he'll protect them as well. He's a defender of us who are his children. What a message that we can preach to ourselves. He's never asleep. He's always alert. Number three, he'll be our defender. Here's the fourth sermon that he preaches to himself. It's this, the Lord is our shade. The Lord is our shade. What's a shade? Well, if you've ever been to the Middle East or Florida uh, or anywhere that's really hot, Arizona, California, maybe a hot summer day in New Jersey, although there's places that are very, very much so uh, hotter. What, where do you look for when you're working in, a, in the excruciating sun? You look for what? Shade. What does the shade do? It gives you a defense, yes, but it, it provides a level of refreshment, rejuvenation, right? When you were, if you were to travel in the desert, there would be these, these things called oasises. Oasises? Is that the plural of oasis? Someone can correct me afterwards, okay? Uh, and these oasis is would be filled with, with trees oftentimes and a source of water. They were a place of refreshment. That's the idea that the, the psalmist is conveying, that the Lord is our shed. He's our place in which we can be rejuvenated, where we can find refreshment, where we can find uh, safety from the beating sun. And Lotus verse 5, the Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. You say, what does that mean? The Lord is the shade upon thy right hand. Does that mean that God only gives shade or refreshment to my right hand? That's kind of odd. What is he talking about? Uh, I grew up in India. I'm actually left-handed. Um, I grew up with using my left hand. And in Eastern cultures, not maybe not everyone, but some Eastern cultures, uh, if you grow up being left-handed, they will beat it out of you, okay? Uh, they don't want you to be left-handed. And so even though I'm naturally left-handed, uh, left-hand uh, 
there's certain things left hands are used for and certain things that right hands are used for. And they want you to use your right hand. So I was taught to write with my right hand. I naturally gravitated towards things with my left hand. Even today when I came to the States and I started learning new things, anything I learned later in life, I do with my left hand. I golf left-handed, for those of you that want to care to know about that. I, I bat left-handed. I kick a soccer ball with my left foot. I'm left-handed naturally, but my parents forced me to use my right hand. And in those cultures, Eastern cultures, the right hand was always the dominant hand. Sorry, left-handed people. Uh, it was looked on that you really couldn't be left-handed. It was always the right hand, okay? And the idea of right hand was the hand that was ready to move to action. It was the dominant hand. It was the hand that was ready to, to, to do the task right in front of you. And the idea of that, that God is our shade on our right hand as he's ready for our action. He is, he is covering. He is, he is overseeing the very movements, that our first tasks, so to speak. Does that make sense? Uh, have you ever met somebody that like just kind of hovers a little bit too close to you? And you don't tell them that because that would be offensive. But, you know, they're just like, like there's a personal space and they're like just, like just a hair on the wrong side of the, the personal space. You know what I'm talking about. Don't look at all pious at, at me, okay? You know those people, right? Don't point them out. Don't look at them. Don't point to them right now, all right? But those people exist, and maybe they don't know. Maybe they do. I don't know. The idea is that there's someone just like, man, right there with you. It's okay if it's your wife, right? If, if it's your spouse, hey, yeah, we like that. We like that company. We like that closeness together. And the idea is, hey, God is our shade right there, right next to us. Our dominant right hand, he is there ever, all the time, ready for wherever our next step is in accordance with his will, he'll be our shade. And so there's some tremendous truth just in that phrase that he is our shade upon thy right hand. And he says this, the sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. I want you to look at that word again, back up with me in verse number five, the Lord is thy keeper. This word keeper has been used in the verb form in verses three and four. He keepeth thee, right? In verse number three, notice verse number four, behold he that keepeth Israel. Now in verse number five, the Bible uses now this verb form as a noun, the Lord is thy keeper. The idea there is this, that not only is the Lord, let me use an in analogy when you, or a hotel analogy, right? Not only is the Lord the keeper of the inn, he's the inn itself, right? Not only is he the one that's the gatekeeper, but he's the gate himself. Not only is the Lord the one that is guarding, he is the guard himself. What a tremendous truth that is there. And so the Lord is our refreshing, rejuvenating shade when we're weary, going up to the Jerusalem, getting to the place where God wants us to be. We look at the dangers around us and we need energy. We need some kind of source of, of, of rejuvenation or refreshment. God will be that for us. The Lord will be our oasis in the desert. God will be our shade upon our right hand. What a tremendous message that you can preach to yourself when you're weary and worn and tired of taking the next step. Remind yourself, God will be my shade. God will be my shade. Here's the fifth sermon. The fifth sermon is this. There will be 24-7 protection from the Lord. There will be 24-7 protection from the Lord. Notice again, verse number six. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. Think of things that are 24-7 drive throughs How many are thankful that drive throughs are, some drive throughs are 24-7 pastor? McDonald's drive throughs too, right? Yes. How many are thankful that policemen are 24-7? We needed a policeman uh, this past week, and uh, not, not for anything major, but uh, hey, it's, it's glad that they're always on call. They're ready to go. They're ready to step in. Hospitals. How many of you are glad the hospitals are 24-7? Those babies that get born in the middle, that are born in the middle of the night, aren't you thankful for hospitals that will take you in even if it's 3 o'clock in the morning? Hey, mom's with a sixth child. Aren't you glad moms are 24-7? They don't take uh, quite a time off. But you know moms do get tired. There's one that's ready to protect 24-7 and he never gets tired. You know who that is? The Lord. The Lord. The sun shall not smite thee by day. So hey, during the daytime, the Lord will protect. He'll give you shade. And even during nighttime, when the moon is out, when everyone else is asleep, but maybe robbers are out. Maybe those people that want to pillage and loot the camp are out. There is a Lord who is always on watch. He's never tired. He never takes a day off. And if we just stop there, man, five powerful sermons that you can preach to yourself and begin with, he will guide our steps. He's never asleep. He's always alert. He'll be our defender. The Lord is our shade, a source of refreshment. He's on clock, 24-7 protecting. But there's three more sermons, and they come really quick in just two verses. And there are three preservation sermons. 
three preservation sermons. I want you to notice verses 7 and 8 as we close. The Bible says, the Lord shall preserve. By the way, this is the same original word for the word keep earlier in the psalm. The idea of defending, guarding, watching over. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The word soul is the word nefesh. It's, it's the living existence that, that belongs to you. That Your very existence is, 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 is encapsulated in the word soul. When God breathed into man, uh, the living breath, that's the idea here. Same word, soul. So the Lord will preserve you from evil. The Lord will preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. These three sermons are so powerful because they, they are so comprehensive of the entire human experience. Not only do these three sermons tell us what we are guarded from, they teach us how much of us is guarded and also how long we will be guarded. So they teach us what you're guarded from, how much of you will be guarded, and how long you will be guarded. What are you guarded from? From evil. The word has the idea also of harm, of anything that would, would cause you to fall, cause you to stumble, cause you to not live for the way that God wants you to live. He will guard you from harm. That's the what. How much will he guard you from? Well, the Bible says, notice again, he shall preserve thy soul. So how much of you? All of you. Every part of your existence is guarded and preserved by God. So how much of you is all of you, but how long? Okay, I get it. He'll guard me from evil. He'll guard me. Uh, he'll guard all of me, but how long? Forever. By coming in and going out as encapsulating of the entire journey to Jerusalem and the way back home and any other future journeys this pilgrim is going to take. And not only on this earth, but until he reaches his final destination in heaven because he uses a word that encapsulates eternity when he says evermore. It is a comprehensive three-point sermon of safety. Man, and where did we start from? We started with a pilgrim going to worship God, looking at menacing, haunting hills, and in trepidation, asking the question, from where comes my help? And he's reminded of the eternal thesis of this psalm and of, uh, of this idea that my help comes from the Lord who made the hills, who made heaven, who made earth. And I've got to keep preaching to myself who this God is and how he provides for me, and how he'll take care of me every step of this journey. And as I preach to myself these eight sermons, I remind myself of the comprehensive nature of God's safety and protection and providence, I will rest in the truth that as I journey through life, the Lord will be my help. The Lord will be my help. Spurgeon encapsulates this psalm with these words, and I'll finish with this. God not only keeps his own in all evil times, but from evil influences and operations, yea, from evils themselves. This is, far, this is a far-reaching word for covering. It includes everything and excludes nothing. The wings of Yahweh amply guard his own from evils, great and small, temporary and eternal. There is a most delightful double personality in this verse. Jehovah keeps the believer not by agents, but by himself. And God's desire for you, Christian, no matter what you have going on, no matter what you have in front of you, for, young, for the young people that are going on this mission trip, for those that are, have plans for this year and you want to be in the center of God's, well, God's desire for you is not to ignore the hills, but to look beyond the hills for your source of help. May the Lord help us to do that. Let's bow together tonight. Father, thank you for your word. I'm thankful for the psalm. I'm thankful for uh, so much truth that has been so comforting to our family's life and my own heart that even when it's difficult, the journey is difficult as we ascend into whatever your will is for us, that we can be reminded that our help comes from Yahweh. Our help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. And I pray as this psalmist possibly preach to himself these verses as you reiterated truths that, that really uh, helped um, support his thesis that the help comes from God, 
I pray that we as your people would, would remind ourselves of these eternal truths over and over and over again so that we can find our source of help beyond the hills. Thank you again for your great love and care for us. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join me in standing?